said, stay for the politics. I'm Ben Walsh, and this is Let Them Eat Bread. Welcome back to Let Them Eat Bread, everyone. Today, we are going to finish making our no-need instant yeast white bread. So, I'm about to show you the work product from last night and explain a little bit how it got there. So this is our lovely and beautiful dough from last night. You can see that it is still in its bowl here. So what we're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna let it kind of come to temperature just a little bit before I roll it out and tell you a little bit about what I did to this bread. So, first of all, we took our, uh, our wet ingredients. We took our yeast, which was a tablespoon and a half of instant yeast, and we took three cups of warm water, about 100 degrees, or the pinky test. Remember, the pinky test is the water should be warm enough that when you dip your pinky in it, you'd want to take a bath in the water, okay? Uh, if you have an instant read thermometer, though, about 100 degrees or 105 degrees is really what we're looking for. Next, we, we stirred our yeast and our water together in a bowl and let that set for just a moment. Now, because it's instant yeast, we're not blooming it, so you don't have to worry about the water getting particularly cloudy or a little foam appearing above the yeast and water mixture. That's not gonna happen with instant yeast, so you really don't have to worry about it. Instead, you're just leaving that long enough so that you can prepare your flour and salt. So you're gonna take six and a half cups of flour and one tablespoon of kosher salt or table salt, although I always use kosher salt, and you're going to combine those in a separate bowl. Then, as soon as they're combined, you're gonna take that flour mixture and pour it into your water mixture, and keep, uh, your yeast mixture, and keep stirring until no dry spots remain. Now, what this means is, when you pour it in originally and start mixing, you're gonna have clumps of flour that stick to the sides of the bowl. These will be little kind of white clumps, and sometimes they'll stick together a little bit more than others. Just take your wooden spoon or your dough or whatever you're using to mix it, and just start to use the dough to scrape away at the sides of the bowl, thus giving you a bowl with no type of, uh, with, with no specific um, patches of flour left. It will not look like a dough. Resist the urge to knead it. You are not supposed to knead it. Just make sure that it looks like it has a little bit of moisture in it and it's more or less one mass. At that point, you're gonna take your plastic wrap and paint using a spoon, your hands, or a paintbrush, a tiny bit of olive oil. I say a teaspoon, but you may not even need that much. Be very conservative here. You wanna make sure that no matter what, you are not putting too much oil on because it will seep into the bread. The only reason we're putting the oil on here is to make it easier to take the plastic off when we're finally ready. Once you've covered it with plastic, throw a towel on it and set it for two hours at room temperature. Now this can go as long as five hours, but if it, if it looks like your bread is starting to outgrow its bowl, that's a, good, that's a good indicator that it's mostly risen and that you'll wanna at this point put it in the refrigerator. Now, the option for the original recipe says that you can bake it right away. You can start the baking process right away, as in what we're gonna do today, right after you finish mixing the dough. But I found actually that the dough becomes much more easy to work with if you set it in the refrigerator uh, for a couple hours. I prefer to do it overnight, so that way I can, you know, late on Friday, just kind of mix together a dough, chuck it in the fridge, not think about it, and then of course come back today to make this beautiful bread with you, okay? So that being said, we're going to uncover our dough here and get rid of our plastic. Okay, and we're going to move this onto a flour board. So let's take some bread flour here and just, now remember, whatever you do with this bread, don't knead it, don't punch it down. The whole purpose of this is to be very kind of low, you know, um, low amounts of work here. It takes a lot of time, it can take a lot of time, um, but the bread is really rewarding. So I'm just using, um, a spatula here to just spread out some of my flour, and you'll see why in a moment. And then I'm going to put some more flour on my spatula as we remove the, the dough from the bowl here. So we're just going to pour it out. Just going to, yeah, just so you can see, I'm just slowly coaxing it out. There is no oil in here to help with sticking. So if you get to a part where it's particularly sticky, just put your hands or your spatula 
back in the flour and you will help to coax it out. I also found that it is easier to do this step if it's been in the fridge overnight. So we're just gonna finish doing that. We're gonna put it on our floured surface here. You can see that once I've unstuck most of it, it really just wants to come out, which is great. All righty, so we have our massive dough here. Put this in the sink. You don't really need this either, but I'm gonna keep it out just in case. So now you're gonna take some flour on your hands and you're just gonna slowly, using the same cupping method we always use, coax it into a ball, okay? Just take your hands, move it around, coax it into a ball. If you need more flour, obviously take some more flour. So the reason we're doing this is because it's gonna make it a little easier to work with. One of the other thing that's nice about having this out of the fridge is that it's cold and it's easier to work with and less likely to stick if it's cold. Okay, so we have our ball here. So the next thing we're gonna do with it, is we're gonna cut it in two. So I am going to put a little bit of flour on my knife and this is just to make it so it doesn't stick. I know I just told you that it's cold and it's not going to stick, but it could still stick. So to the extent possible, just run a little bit of flour uh, on your knife. And then we're just going to go right down the middle and cut this. Okay. You don't have to use a serrated. Um, it will work just fine without a serrated. In fact, it might even work better without a serrated. Last time, I believe I did it without a serrated knife and it worked just fine. Okay, so at this point we are done with our knife. We are, uh, we're not done with our knife, sorry, sorry, we're not done with our knife. So what happens now is we have two halves of our dough here. So we're gonna do the exact same thing. But before we do, I'm gonna tell you why I have two upside down sheet trays here with parchment over them, okay? So what we're gonna do, we've divided this into two halves and as it comes to temperature, we're gonna actually let it rise independently upside down on these sheet trays. And the reason we're doing it upside down is essentially we're going to quickly slide these off into our prepared sheet tray in the oven, which, will pre which we will preheat during the politics section. And once we do that, it'll be hot enough so that it will give us a nice brown crust as soon as we move this parchment from these cool boards to the very hot board. Okay, so for now, we're just gonna do the same basic thing. We're gonna shape these into a ball, just using the cupping mechanism here. Flip it over if you want. Just make it a little easier to work with. Okay. Again, do not need, all right? All right, so our first round here, we're gonna just take that and you may actually have to do some work with it on, um, on, the sh on the tray. So if you do, just get a little bit more flour into your hands and just shape it the way you want to. If you're really having difficulty with this stage, you can tape your plastic down to the board. Okay, but you shouldn't really need to do that. So once again, we're gonna take our hands with some flour. I'm gonna take this loaf and we're just gonna shape it into a nice, ball, start sticking, just put more flour on your hands. It's the best way to do that. All right, so we're gonna take it, we're gonna cut, yeah, look how nice that ball is. I'm just gonna take it and put it down. All right, so I'm just gonna keep creating that ball. So we've got two balls now. I'm gonna shape, I'm gonna reshape this one just a little bit. So it's more the shape I want it to be, which is a sphere. Actually, let's take it back on here a little bit because it is not as nice a shape as it could be. All right, perfect. All right, I'm just gonna, same thing as last time. 
let's uh, let's weight this down just a little bit. All right. So we have two lovely bread balls here. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our knife once again. Now the recipe says you can cut this before or after we do the rising, but we're going to cut it before um, because when I've tried it, that is the way that this worked best. So we're going to take our knife, cut it with flour, and this is just for design. So if you have a lamb, instead of using a knife, feel free to use a bread lamb. Um, if you want, they're, they're fairly inexpensive. You can buy them uh, in a lot of places, but we're going to just do three slashes across while we let these rise, okay? So we're going to do one slash, two slash, three slash. Okay, and this is just to give our bread a nice look. Once again, one slash, two slash, three slash. Now you want these slashes to be about um, you want these slashes to be about half an inch deep into the bread. So if you are slashing with a serrated knife, you may need to go the other way as well to make sure that slash is exactly the depth that you want it. Okay, so I'm gonna do that. All right, so you get that nice, those nice slashes on bread, right? That's what we're doing here. All right, so now we are gonna let these rest and we're gonna do our politics segments for about an hour and 15 minutes. 35 minutes in, we're gonna set our ovens to 450 degrees. What that is going to allow us to do, um, so in the oven right now, I have, a large sheet tray turned upside down. What we're gonna do, once this is fully hot, we're not gonna take it out again, but once the oven is preheated and it preheats for about 20 minutes so that this gets nice and hot, we're gonna slide these pieces of parchment onto this so that the heat from it can create a nice crust on the bottom. While we do that, oops, sorry about the noise. While we do that, we're gonna take our bottom rack and we're gonna put in a pan there, and we're gonna let that get nice and hot with the tray. So once we do that, once it's fully preheated and it's been preheating for about 20 minutes with the end of our politics segment, we're gonna take some boiling water. I have an electric water heater here. I will start boiling the water uh, a couple minutes before, well, I'm gonna start boiling the water when we end. So that'll be ready in a couple of minutes. Then what we're gonna do um, is well, I'm gonna instruct you on how to bake this, okay? So this is actually a really easy bake uh, and we're just gonna move forward from there. So set your, if you did it the refrigerator method, you're gonna to wanna to put about an hour and 15 minutes on the clock to allow these to grow appropriately in size. Now, if you've done it not right out of the refrigerator and this dough is not cold, then you are welcome to only do it for about 40 minutes and that should be plenty of time for your bread to rise, okay? So I'm gonna put this in the lower rack of our oven and we will get to politicking. So set your timers and let's get going. All right, actually let me just, yeah, let me just tuck this guy in a little bit so it doesn't grow off of our our dish here. All right, so let me get my hands a quick rinse and then we'll begin. So at this point, we no longer need our knife or our spatula, so you can throw them in the sink if you want. All right, give me one second and we'll be ready to go. All right, so let's see what's on the whiteboard this week, shall we? All righty. So we have lots and lots of topics, uh, and I do not see anyone in the chat right now, so we are just gonna get started. Uh, we're just gonna get started with this, so. Okay. All right, so the first topic I would like to talk to you all about is a bit of a niche issue here, but I actually think it's really important for you to know about, 
and it's important that this news isn't buried. And I'm not saying that anyone's burying it in particular, it's very much out in the open, but it's one of those pieces of news that you don't always hear a lot about unless you're in very specific circles. So what am I talking about? There were two, uh, there are two Supreme Court cases that I wanna to bring to your attention. One has already been decided and one is coming up. So the first US Supreme Court case I wanna to bring to your attention is called the Van Buren versus United States. And this is a criminal case uh, against an individual named Van Buren who was a police officer who used a computer that he had access to to look up something for personal benefit. So I'm sure many of you are aware that one of the issues with the national, um, with the NSA is that it was doing bulk data collection, but also more than that, people were using their access to these bulk data systems to look up ex-lovers, to spy on people that they were jealous of and things like that. There were, there were rampant amount of abuse. So Congress has passed this law uh, called the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And essentially this law um, doles out criminal penalties for individuals and organizations that misuse their access to um, databases. There are two words specifically uh, there are two clauses specifically that the Supreme Court is going to be looking at in these two cases. The first clause is excessive access to. Uh, and the second clause, although I'm forgetting the exact wording of it, has to do with so the scraping of information. As in, what are you allowed to take from what is in theory publicly available information? Okay? So in Van Buren versus the United States, this police officer takes, uh, he has access to a database about lots of individuals with lots of personal information in it. Um, and he uses his access in order to facilitate a personal search of some kind. So he was charged under the act. And as the case worked its way up to the Supreme Court, essentially the, the last ruling before the Supreme Court touched it was, hey, this is a violation, clearly him using his police access, his professional access to this database for a personal lookup is clearly a violation of the law and clearly meets the grounds of excessive use. Straightforward, right? Apparently not so much. So this case ends up going to the Supreme Court and um, our lovely right-wing majority on the Supreme Court, uh, please note the sarcasm there, it decided six to three that actually a cop looking, using their access to a public system in order to make a personal lookup is not a violation of the CFAA and is not excessive access. So I want you to pause and think about that for a second, what the implications are for you. Before I move to the next case, this is so important. You or I or anyone else appears in multiple databases. Some of them are all are even law enforcement databases, right? Whether you've got a, a speeding ticket or you know you you got thrown out of a club or, or whatever may have happened to you, right? There's a good chance that all of us are in some registry somewhere. We, you know, we ran a red light, we got a speeding ticket, uh, we parked illegally, right? We end up in these databases. And a lot of information goes into these databases, including personal information, like your name, your address, your birthday, sometimes even more sensitive information about you. Uh, so that's really worrying, right? That, that, that all this information is floating out about there, but we are supposed to be comforted by the fact that these people who access these databases are professionals. They wouldn't use their access for personal grievances, would they? Well, that's kind of the fairy tale that we're all told, but we know from the NSA leaks that this, uh, that Edward Snowden gave us, that this is what happens, that there is, there are huge abuses of the access to these data systems. So what this means is, is that any database that you appear in, for whatever reason, as long as the individual is allowed access to that database as part of their job, that means they can just look you up for no reason. A judge doesn't have to approve it. A supervisor doesn't have to approve it. They don't even have to be on the clock. As long as they can access this database, essentially what happens is you become the target of unwarranted spying. And what if this person is looking out for bad reasons? What if they want to do harm to you? Your name and address are on there, right? Um, the car you drive, the, the type of home, maybe even the amount of, uh, you know, other information, family details, uh, where you work, 
you know, where you go to where you go to uh, your house of worship, right? There are so many things that could possibly be in this that people could put together and they could do harm to you. And even if they're not doing harm to you, they can be violating your privacy on a huge level. So clearly we need better privacy protections, at least in this sphere, because this type of abuse should be punishable. You should not be allowed to abuse your work resources for your personal vendettas or gripes or what have you. And by the way, this is especially true if you're in law enforcement, because you are supposed to be responsible to the people, to regular everyday Joe and Janes, that we pay you, right? The whole purpose about law enforcement is that we pay them. You're supposed to protect and serve us. And of course, law enforcement, as I've discussed many times on this show, has lots of other issues with it. But this just adds to the level of, of uh, the level that law enforcement tramples on our freedoms. This is supposed to be a key thing that the Fourth Amendment was supposed to protect against, unlawful search and seizure. And anytime someone abuses their access to a database where you have personal information, that is a search. And what they do with that information, who knows? Because no one's monitoring it. There's no secondary controls that allow for someone to stop it. Now, luckily, this cop got caught. I don't really know how, but I imagine that this is also happening in areas where people aren't getting caught. And that's really nerve-wracking. There's really no excuse for this kind of, you know, uh, for, there's really no excuse for this kind of behavior. And if it's difficult to trace, then that makes it even worse. Um, so the solution obviously here is for the federal government to pass some sort of uh, amendment to the CFAA that clarifies the meaning of excessive access and allows it to cover incidents like this. The Supreme Court, for its sake, said that, oh, well, you know, if you made this type of searching illegal, then plenty of people who do not so naughty things with it will get swept up. I don't really buy that argument. I don't think lots of people out there are just casually abusing databases that they get access to for work for their personal, you know, for, for personal things. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I really don't think that's the case. So that's our first case, in, uh, Van Buren versus United States. Then there's our second case, which is LinkedIn versus HiQ. And that's, if you want to look it up, the, uh, you know how LinkedIn is spelled, uh, capital L, capital I. But high Q is H I. They're both lowercase, and then the letter Q, which is capital. Okay, um, you know this is not a. You know, I'm, I'm not throwing out to Q and on people here. But it's just the way the company spelled. And in this case that LinkedIn is trying to get before the Supreme Court, LinkedIn claims that this company high Q is essentially a data trawler. So what does that mean? So essentially, it takes information that's kind of sort of publicly information like information you publish on your social media, specifically LinkedIn, and it uses it to sell you services. Well, so is this that different than other cookie services? Yeah, it is, because when you signed up for LinkedIn, the expectation was that this information would be public to other LinkedIn users. And of course, you have the ability to change the privacy settings in your individual LinkedIn page. But, Essentially, what HiQ is doing is they are just going through and taking as much information as can, collecting as much personal information that you're willing to put out there as you can for their own purposes that you didn't consent to. In many other countries, including in European countries, this kind of secondary use of data is actually already illegal because the requirement is that in order for your data to be used by anyone for any purpose, you have to give a very specific consent for it. Now, different privacy laws in the US are coming up that seem that will start to address this problem. However, once again, we are stuck relying in this particular case on the CFAA because this, uh, because this is kind of large batch scraping of personal information that this company is doing. Now, for HiQ's part, they say that they've actually been doing this for a very long time and it's never been an issue. Except now LinkedIn wants to offer a very similar service and they're suing HiQ in order to kick in order to kick them out of the market for this particular thing. Whether that's true or not, it actually doesn't really matter. 
So when this case goes up to, up to the Supreme Court, it's true that the court will make some level of decisions about whether what high Q, what high Q is doing is illegal or not, but there's a more pernicious factor in here, which is we still have incredible issues with data privacy. Whether the Supreme Court decides yay or nay on this is, an, this is illegal under CFAA, the fact that there are organizations that have been trawling our data for long amounts of time without our consent is still problematic. California and many other states have moved forward with comprehensive privacy laws, which would at least help a little bit with this problem. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is this law creates a patchwork. So it's become, first of all, for corporations who I don't typically have sympathy for, but I will say in the effort to protect our data against themselves and to not be struck with fines, it becomes very difficult for companies to comply with these kind of variable agreements, especially when multiple states have very different and sometimes conflicting ways of protecting data. So as we move forward, the obvious solution here is for the federal government to act and to create more privacy through privacy laws, and more specifically, to amend the CFAA if they don't pass a regular privacy law, amend the CFAA to make it so that this kind of trawling is illegal. But hopefully I've been able to illustrate that these two Supreme Court cases are really important to you. And if you can, do give them a look up and a read. It's really fascinating to see kind of what the arguments are on both sides for and against this very specific type of, of usage of data, and it makes you wonder why it is that we're not able to get some form of privacy protection. Many of you may remember the Experian breach, uh, the Equifax breach, I mean, where millions and millions of records were just lost, and many organizations that you invest in, and probably that you trust as well, have had large-scale data breaches, but oftentimes, these companies are barely fined. Executives don't go to jail. And a lot of the time, real people lose out. Once your identity is out there, pretty much anything can be done with it. Profiles can be set up in your name. People can pretend to be you. And either they can do things that will directly harm you, or they can just make it harder for you, the individual, to do anything unless, say, you pay them. Or you, you, know, you buy some other service to protect your identity. But oftentimes, once your personal information is out there, unless you have the ability to change that personal information, and by the way, for much of our personal information, it is either difficult or impossible to change, think things like your home address, your social security number, um, or if you're watching from another country, your national health or other national identity number, um, and, and other types of things, the type of car you drive, uh, what you look like. This kind of information is all important to us. It helps identify us. It's called personally identifiable information. And in the United States, we really do not take a lot of effort to protect this kind of information. In fact, I have another story right after this one that I'm going to talk additionally about different types of surveillance that is that are a different type of surveillance that is done uh, on Americans and on people all around the world. But just to come back and to close this story out, these two Supreme Court cases Van Buren versus the United States and LinkedIn versus HiQ are important for regular people to think about when they go to the ballot box because essentially there are lots of issues going on. I totally get that. And many of those issues may feel much more pressing than a privacy issue. Well, who cares if they have my name, piece of information here? It's not like they can do anything with it, but that's wrong. They can do something with it. And the things that they can do with it can really hurt you. We have the ability to protect this information, to hold corporations accountable, but we can't do that unless the lawmakers that we are constantly talking, that we are talking to or electing are on the same page here. So it is my hope that if you don't take anything else away from this segment, you at least remember that we need more privacy protections in this country, whether we pass a, nas a nationwide separate privacy bill or we just update the CFAA. We need to take a stand to improve our privacy in this country. And if we don't, who knows how many people are going to be affected by the pernicious effects of identity theft and other such mimicry before we, uh, before we are able to solve this problem.
please forgive the sound of the ice cream man outside. It's kind of rain. I don't even know why they're coming. All right. Next topic. I want to talk about biometric surveillance. So first of all, I need to take a step back before I discuss should biometric surveillance be banned? It's going to be our red sticky. So first of all, we have to think what is what are biometrics, right? That's the first question. I want to break this down so that we all understand where we are. So what are biometrics? So think about things on you, your person, uh, a fingerprint, or your face print, or the sound of your voice, or your retinas. All of those things are unique. They're identifiable to you. No one else has one exactly like you, for the most part. Any of these pieces of information can be used to identify you. Sometimes these are called biometric markers or biometric identifiers because it is easy to use them to identify a particular individual. And I'm sure all of you have seen crime shows where someone puts a very special piece of what looks like scotch tape on a surface, you pull off a fingerprint and ta-da, you identify the criminal and they go to jail and life goes happily ever after for Law and Order SVU or whatever crime show you're watching. But Unfortunately, that's not the only time that these types of biometric markers or biometric identifiers are collected about you. If you use your fingerprint, your face, your eye, or your voice to open your phone, someone's collecting that information. And whether they're doing it for your benefit or for their own benefit, that information has to be protected. Because guess what? Just unlike some of the information that we talked about in the last segment that can be changed, who you are physiologically doesn't change and you can't change it. And once an information is stolen from you or is able to be used on your behalf, you may never be able to get it back. You, I'm sure you've heard about deep fakes, the ability to mimic someone else's voice. The reason that privacy professionals and advocates find these so dangerous is because essentially part of the way that we as humans establish trust with each other is through things like our voice and through video, right? The phrase "picks or it didn't happen because we're requiring photo evidence to be given in order for us to believe someone, to trust someone. Now, of course, Photoshop and other such programs have made that trust a little bit more difficult. But now with deep fakes, not only is it more difficult to trust people, but the harm that can be put against people, uh, that can be uh, exacted against other individuals also becomes heightened. There can be fake sex tapes. Um, you can essentially have someone's face glued on someone else to make it look like they committed the terrible crime or did something else that they wouldn't or couldn't do. You can frame people for all sorts of things as long as it's easy to make it look and sound like they were the ones doing it. So of course, we need some kind of protection with these very, very specific and sensitive pieces of information that we carry around with us from the day that we're born. So, what is biometric surveillance? So essentially, now that you know what biometric markers identify and, identify, uh, and biometric identifiers are, how do you think the state will begin to use this information? Now, you may live in a city with closed circuit television or CCTV which is essentially monitoring you all the time, right? There are traffic cameras, there are, sometimes businesses have cameras outside, sometimes the city itself puts cameras all over the place. London is a great example of this, where there are just cameras everywhere. There are video feeds being collected all the time. And I'm sure you've passed under security cameras or seen a sign on a window saying, smile, you're on camera. This type of information in a closed circuit isn't necessarily problematic, because of what is typically done or not done with it. However, in the hands of law enforcement, they have developed technologies to be able to identify individuals by things like their face, their voice, or even their fingerprints if they can get the right camera angle. This is really worrying because essentially, once they have the ability to recognize your face, they can recognize your face in a crowd, they can recognize your face in any type of situation where you may want to rank hidden, or even if you don't want to remain hidden, you just don't want to be surveilled. That is a piece of your freedom that is taken away by the fact that you are being constantly surveilled and that you can be easily identified by things you can't change. 
Now, this has been made a little bit more difficult during the coronavirus pandemic because many people were wearing masks. And in some ways, there was some hope amongst privacy professionals and amongst advocates that, hey, maybe the solution um, to this is to just have people wear masks like is done in many other countries for a variety of reasons. And once the masks are being worn, it becomes much harder for these facial recognition systems to put two and two together. However, there are lots of anti-maskers around, but additionally, many of us in this country and in most countries didn't actually end up, uh, didn't start their lives with the idea that mask wearing was normal and not unusual or that you wore masks regularly or even that you were supposed to wear a mask when you were sick or can wear a mask when you're sick. So there is movement to get rid of these masks, which totally makes sense if you felt like if you were happy not wearing a mask, or if you didn't wear a mask usually beforehand, and all of a sudden you're being required to wear one, you may be very happy to finally take it off. But once you do that, it's much more easy to identify you, which is good, by the way, for regular human contact too. I don't want to make it seem like the whole mask, no mask thing just applies to your protection from law enforcement. But I'm sure you've walked past someone who you thought you recognized but weren't sure because you couldn't see their entire face. As human beings, we use faces to identify each other. But this can also be used by law enforcement to surveil us without our permission or knowledge. So recently, a petition has started circling around by a bunch of advocacy organizations um, that essentially says, hey, we should not allow law enforcement to use our, the, the, our, our speech patterns, our fingers, our faces, or our eyes, or any other biometric marker that they can think of to track us without our consent. Now, this is incredibly important because it's just one more way that we protect ourselves from unlawful searches and seizures. Fundamentally, at the very basis of American privacy is the understanding that we are not supposed to be searched by the law unless we've done something wrong or suspicious. Now, this has many loopholes, and over the years, this protection has gotten much weaker. In some other countries, like the European Union, part of the European Fundamental Charter of Human Rights is the fact that data and data privacy and just personal privacy is considered a fundamental right, a bedrock of what the rights of all Europeans are meant to be. So, in order for some, in order for this type of privacy to be banned, there has to be some gargantuan and very important reason that the state or the locality can go after an individual or search for them in a way that violates their consent because privacy is considered fundamental. It is the cornerstone of, of European personal rights and freedoms. Now, we don't really see it that way in the US and there are many countries that don't see it this way. But the organizations that are looking to get this banned I've essentially said, look, there are too many ways that this type of data can be abused. Therefore, regardless of what you believe about other types of privacy, there should be laws passed to ban the use of this type of data from public spheres. What's interesting is that this petition also asks for, uh, also asks for individuals to not use biometric identifiers or cameras where they're not particularly necessary, um, or to avoid giving that information uh, to public authorities where possible. Now, of course, that's going to be difficult to do without a law, but the underpinnings of this petition is, hey, lawmakers, you should be making sure that under no circumstances are individuals being forced to, uh, are being forced to give up their biometric identifiers without their consent. And that consent needs to be, you know, open and honest and transparent. And even if they do give it up, this type of information should not be used by law enforcement. Now, this could make it easier for criminals in theory, since that will be the obvious pushback, but it's not like policing was invented yesterday or, or law enforcement was, was invented yesterday and there are no other proven tactics that law enforcement can take in order to catch bad guys, as it were. So the question, we come back to the original question, should biometric surveillance be banned? And the answer, in my personal opinion, is unequivocally yes. We have to ban this type of surveillance because just like all types of data of, of surveillance, 
that co just collects and collects and collects, there's just data out there on anyone, on almost on everyone. And the people with access to that data, who knows what they can do with it? Who knows what skills they have? And if there's nothing to protect us from the people who have access to that data, and this data just keeps getting collected, no matter how we change our appearance or, or our voice or anything else, or even our other types of information, then we get to a point where we do lose out on our, on our freedom and we do lose out on our privacy. And I want to say one more thing about surveillance in general before I end this segment. Many people believe that, hey, if you don't have anything to hide, then there's no reason to worry about being surveilled. If you're one of the good guys, there's no worries, right? Well, that opinion is fundamentally flawed in a number of ways, one of which is you probably have some level of, and I really don't like to use this word, privilege, as it were, if you can say that. Essentially, you have the ability to say, because I'm not doing anything wrong, no one will suspect me. Many types of, many groups of people do not have that luxury. No matter what they do, they are suspected of, of committing a crime or preparing for a crime or anything like that. So their kind of right to innocence, as it were, is taken away from them. And if they can be surveilled because they might commit a crime, then they lose more than just their privacy. They lose their freedom. Another thing is, if you're constantly being surveilled, you change your behavior. You might not think you do. You might think, well, if, I mean, who cares who's watching? But you do. Humans fundamentally do. As a species, we change our behavior based on who's around and who's watching us. And if we think that someone with the power to harm us or take away our liberties is constantly watching us, it represses our behavior. What happens if you think you're always being surveilled and you see an injustice? Are you going to go over and help? Are you going to, or are you going to turn away, afraid of what the consequences might be for you if you're caught? But, I'll, you know, what, what else is it possibly that you might do? What might you not say if you're worried that you're always being surveilled? These things we don't often think about consciously, but in the back of our minds, we do change our behavior when the camera's rolling. Hell, I change my behavior when this camera's rolling. I'm definitely not the exact same person I am behind the camera that I am in real life. But that's the point, though. Even though that this is a friendly environment where I'm not worried about my liberty or anything else being taken away from me, based on the opinions that I espouse here and the points that I make on this show, I do alter my behavior, whether I'm doing it for to curate a larger audience or whether I'm doing it just to be more performance worthy and to make the quality of the show higher. We change our behaviors for better or for worse because we're being surveilled, even if that surveillance is voluntary or understood. So the constant surveillance and feeling that someone's always watching you, you're going to change how you behave, whether you believe it or whether you believe you're doing it or not. And so when this type of surveillance can so, can so, can identify you so well and, and in such a niche and pinpoint way, it really hampers what we might do and say. Now, you know, if you think this is a good thing, I just fundamentally disagree with you, but wait till you're the one being surveilled all the time. I think your opinions on this particular issue will change. And you'll see that at the end of the day, the question of should biometric surveillance be banned is an easy one. The answer is yes. All right, we're going to take a quick break in our uh, our session. If you have and uh, if you are baking with me right now, please set your ovens to four hundred and fifty degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure that the tray you're gonna put your water in and the tray that you are going to bake your bread on are both in the oven in the appropriate places. You want your, the, your, um, your pan that you're gonna put the water in either on the lowest rack or on the floor of your oven. I highly recommend the lowest rack. Your upside down tray or your pizza stone or whatever you're using to cook your bread on top of will need to be, uh, will need to be on the rack above that preferably in the middle, so that when the bread puffs up and rises up, it doesn't hit the ceiling of your oven and burn, especially because we're cooking at a very high temperature. So we're gonna take a quick pause to set our ovens, and then we'll get back to politics. Okay. 
One last thing before I go back to our politics segment. If for some reason you have a, uh, sorry, if for some reason you have a very sensitive fire alarm, now might be a good time to encourage it to look the other way as your, as your oven gets really hot, okay? Um, my fire alarm is very sensitive, so if I have to suddenly run off set, the reason is I'm turning off my fire alarm. Hopefully you all can forgive me uh, and then we'll get through this together. One of the reasons I'm setting this, the setting the oven now while we have about 40 minutes left is this is going to allow for the trays to get really, really hot. Um, you should let your tray preheat for at least 20 minutes in order to make sure that the tray is as hot as it possibly can, can be when you A, pour the water into the pan, and B, you know, move your bread onto, uh, move your bread onto your upside on the tray or your pizza stone in order to make sure that you have the, um, to get the best heat possible so you get a nice, beautiful crust on the bottom of your bread, okay? All right. So. Let's go back to politics. So the next thing I want to talk about is another kind of law and crime issue. I want to talk about fines specifically and why fines are problematic. And I'm not just going to talk about crimes committed by individuals. I'm also going to talk to I'm also going to talk about crimes for corporations or nations or other such organizations that engage in criminal behavior. Okay. So the first issue with a fine is that it revolves around money. Okay, Ben, this is the most obvious thing in the world. Hold your horses. So if you are given a fine, regardless of what the fine is, when you go to pay it, it is going to take away from your ability to do other things with that money. If you have a low income, then, so I'll give you an example. In the city, that, in Philadelphia, the uh, where I live, there is a, a fine for illegal parking. It's $26. Okay, doesn't sound like a ton of money, but if you're living paycheck to paycheck and any little emergency or any little um, expense could hurt your ability to feed yourself or keep a roof over your head, $26 could be a ton of money. But if you're doing really well or you're rich or you um, work in an industry where you're paid a lot of money, $26 might be nothing. Essentially, what happens here is that because the fines don't scale with income, fining becomes a regressive tax, which is to say, fine, crimes that are punishable by fines only really affect the poor. This type of classism, and this is in addition to the, 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 uh, the class war that I always talk about, this type of classism really hurts people and it makes it so that certain crimes can be committed more or less with wants and abandon by individuals who have more money. Now, I use the parking as an example, but think of other types of crimes, larceny and, and, others, uh, and, and other such crimes, um, money laundering, things like that. If there is only a fine for whatever the crime happens to be, then what's it to a rich person? I just pay the fine and move on with their life. And if there's no chance they can ever be punished further, then there's no real disincentive to stop committing the crime. For a, per, for a poor person who parks illegally, $26 might be a huge incentive to never park illegally again, or to be really careful about when you park, to make sure that you know, you, you've got your meter full, or you're parking free parking, or you're not outside the parking, or whatever it's gonna be, right? But to a rich person, parking legally, 26 bucks is pocket change. It means nothing to them. Okay, you pay the fine, who cares? It doesn't bother them at all. And there's because it doesn't bother them at all, there's no disincentive to commit the crime again, and again, and again, and over and over again, until some other level of punishment kicks in. So that kind of makes sense, right? Now, many of our crimes are punishable by jail time. And while I think there are uh, there certainly are issues with the carceral state, it is true, at least for the most part, that going to prison is a deterrent for crime, which is to say that people who people who understand that are thinking rationally and understand that the risk of something is losing their liberty may choose not to commit that crime. Now, that's not to say that every criminal acts rationally or anything like that, but. 
What it is to say is, in theory, now I know this doesn't happen in the US, but in theory, a rich person and a poor person can go to jail and that deprives them of the same type of liberty, right? It, it hurts them in the same kinds of ways. They can lose their job, they can lose their home, they can lose their familial connections. Um, they lose years or months or, or hour or however long off their life, right? They get something they can't get back. They lose something they can't get back, I'm sorry. And in that sense, it's that seems like a more just punishment, and it seems that it might have the same deterrent effect for people who are rich and who are poor. Abolitionists, don't at me. Uh, this isn't about abolition. This is just about the differences between fining and, imprison and incarceration in general, regardless of the issues that we all have um, with the carceral state and how incarceration has been used uh, to perpetuate race and class war. Okay, just putting that aside, okay, don't at me. So if you think about the conversation we just had with uh, concerning how fines only really affect the poor, well, that also translates to an organizational context. So if you're an organization, uh, say Wells Fargo, and you spend your time making fake accounts for your customers in order to get them to, you know, in order to make it look like you're doing more business so that you can do, you know, you can get bigger bonuses or you make the company look better or what have you, the company makes money off of those practices. And there are lots of other practices, uh, illegal practices that companies make lots of money on. If you're a large company and you only get fined for your participation in the crime, then it seems as if there is no real disincentive for you to stop doing the bad thing. In theory, you could essentially decide that a fine is just a cost of doing business. So for example, if you're a company that makes a billion dollars perpetuating a fraud, but the government only finds you a couple million dollars or like $200,000 or something less than the amount of money you made, then if you run a cost benefit analysis, it makes sense to perpetuate the fraud again because you made more money than you lost and the company paid it. You as an executive or someone who could in theory be accountable or fix it didn't suffer any consequences. You didn't lose any money. You didn't go to jail. You didn't have any consequences perpetuated on you. In fact, nothing happened to you, right? I mean, maybe you lose your reputation a little bit, but what do you do? There are two solutions to this problem that may be deterrent for frauds reported by all levels of organizations. Now, of course, if you're a tiny organization, and you make a lot of money on a fraud and you're fined that amount of money or you're fined less than that, it still may hurt you a lot. But as your company gets larger and you have more capital, um, and by that I mean money, to, to move around and expend in things, then you may see fines as a cost of doing business. Just like in some countries, bribery is a cost of doing business, even though it's wrong. So, essentially, you get to the point where you need a solution that stops corporations, uh, especially large corporations, from engaging in these frauds that they make tons of money on. And in my opinion, there are two solutions here. Again, abolitionists, and I apologize, don't at me. The first one is to incarcerate or otherwise directly punish individuals who are at the top of these organizations who have what is called, in the legal world, management control. So what management control means is essentially an individual in a company that can help shape the direction of a company. This is typically your C-level people, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, and things like that. Sometimes it's the board of directors who will outline uh, to whom the CEO is typically held accountable in a public company. If those people go to jail or are threatened with the possibility of going to jail or, pro or probation or whatever it's going to be, it's entirely possible that they think twice before effectuating the scam regardless of how much money it's going to make them. The other thing that you can do is that you can make these scams more costly to run than they are beneficial. What is, so what this essentially means is, if we go back to our billion dollar example earlier, if you're a company that runs a billion dollar fraud and you're charged $2 billion or $3 billion or even more than that, or even just $1.1 billion, when you do the calculation, it becomes very obvious that 
it is less profitable to commit the fraud than it is to just do business as usual. Because no matter how much money you made off the fraud, it seems that the government is going to charge you more. And the government had a couple ways of doing this. One, they can simply just fine you whatever, uh, whatever number is slightly larger than the amount of money you made, or they can require you to do what's called restitution, plus a fine. Restitution is the legal concept where you give back to those whom you've harmed. So imagine if a corporation uh, steals $100,000 um, from some individuals. So what they're going to end up, what they're going to end up doing um, is if a, if a law catches them and says, hey, you stole $100,000 from individuals, we're going to punish you. The government has a couple of, the first option the government has is just to say, well, we're going to charge you $110,000 for your crime. And then the state gets all of the money um, that was made during the fraud plus a little extra. So shift that balance of fraud or no fraud in the no fraud direction. But the other thing you can do, which is a more, uh, which is, in my opinion, exacts more justice, is to say, well, actually, the fine for what you did is not going to be that large. However, you have to give back all the money that you stole. You have to give back all the profits that you made off of this fraud. So if you stole $100,000, you have to give the $100,000 back to the people um, that you stole it from. And if, and on top of that, we're also going to add a fine. And you could be a small fine. It doesn't have to be a large fine. But at that point, no matter which route you take, however you exact justice, you end up in a situation where the fraud is harder to perpetuate in fi pure financial terms because the balance has shifted from fraud is uh, fraud is profitable to fraud is not profitable. So, again, I don't want this segment to be a, a, a banner for incarceration to say that jailing people is good and that there's nothing wrong with the carceral system and worse, the carceral state. There are so many issues with it. And I highly recommend that you spend some time to look at them. I've certainly talked about them on this show. I'm sure I will continue to talk about them on this show. But this segment is specifically about, does it make sense to use fines? monetary penalties as as punishments for crimes. And I think on the individual level, it almost never makes sense because any crime for which a fine is the only penalty, it's only, uh, it's, it is essentially a crime that is only um, enforced against poor people, that only deters poor people, that the rich can get away with committing. On an organizational level though, I think the question is slightly different. I think actually fines can be a good way of causing companies to rethink their actions. But the, the point is the cost of the crime, uh, the, the cost of the punishment has to be higher than the reward gained. Whether you do it in restorative means, restorative justice means by requiring, um, uh, requiring restitution on top of the penalty or just making the penalty larger than the crime, regardless of how you do it, you can shift the balance of rational acting that the corporation or organization makes from fraud is profitable to fraud is not profitable. And in theory, you can reduce the amount of frauds that happen. So hopefully this has been a good primer on the issues with finding as a punishment and hope, and I hope you will, uh, will start to look at the way that society treats fines and treats certain crimes and educate yourself a little bit about why it doesn't make sense to use fines necessarily as punishment for crimes. So, I want to talk to you about a, a more light-hearted type of story, not inherently positive in any way, shape, or form, but just, you know, lighter. So if you have a smartphone, you probably have some games on that smartphone. And my guess is you didn't pay for those smartphone games, right? A lot of the times you download those smartphone games for free. And when you do that, you essentially get a, a free to play experience. Now that free play experience may come with some detriments, right? You may have to watch ads, 
you may have limited features, there may be a premium version of whatever app or game that you've downloaded, but you can essentially, you're getting a demo of something that in theory you can upgrade and make better. On phones, this seems to make sense. Many people are uh, transfer phones often, and back in and, and a couple of years ago, it was difficult to transfer games between one device to another because not all the games were compatible with the newest operating systems, and you know these the, the software changes so quickly, and it just becomes difficult to get games uh, to hold on to games for a long time, and because of that, it made it difficult to sell them for money. Right, so people were very comfortable not paying for these games. Okay, so kind of makes sense the, the way that it's done on mobile phones. However, those of you who have consoles or are PC gamers may have noticed that there's a surprising and perhaps worrying trend about video games in general. There are starting to be a large emergence of free plus games. So what does that mean? So that little plus is a little deceptive. So it's called in-app purchases. And if you have smartphone games, I'm sure you're aware of these, what these are. But if you're not, essentially it says you can play the base game for free, but there will be certain things in the game that you are not allowed to access or that require you to pay money to get. Now, oftentimes, and in the games that I think are best designed, um, these, what are called microtransactions, essentially payments for little things in games, revolve things that don't fundamentally change the way the game works. Things like how your character or characters look, um, what type of home they can have, what, what, you know, aesthetics, things that don't affect gameplay. But there are also games that do require you to purchase these game-changing things, and that kind of becomes problematic, and it allows for what's called pay-to-win. So you must be thinking at this point, why is Ben talking about this? This clearly is not a worker issue. I The reason I bring this up, so E3, the game, gaming conference, was recently, and there were a bunch of articles written about it before it happened and during it happened, and one of those articles talked a little bit about that the market, the gaming market, was moving towards free-to-play games and away from your traditional $30, $60 PC or console game. But actually, I'm actually here to refute that. I'm here to argue that that's not true. So the reason I don't think that's true is because, I, well, let me take a step back. Why would people want to play games for free and then buy things on the back end or rely on other people buying things on the back end to make it work? One might be that the quality of games hasn't increased that much and the price of games increases fairly regularly. When I was younger, uh, when I bought my first PC game, the cost of the game was $30. Was, um, was $30. And that was like, for a complete game, you didn't have to add anything. It had, you know, it had a fleshed out single player campaign. Sometimes it even had multiplayer, but you know, multiplayer was spotty because you were relying on the host internet connection. Everyone remembers their Halo 2 days, right? Where essentially there were no central servers or dedicated servers. There were just you and your console was having everyone else join onto your console. They were connected to you over the internet and they played essentially for as long as your internet could handle them. But games started to move to a model where multiplayer became king. Single player games began to fade and companies began to optimize the multiplayer existence by allowing for people to play on dedicated servers. But these servers cost them money, and if you buy a game only once, then you only give them that injection of money one time. So the oldest game that I can think of that actually relied on this subscriber model is World of Warcraft, which by the way, was incredibly popular, and continues to be incredibly popular to this day. The subscription model has never hurt them. Uh, and that game gets you both ways because you have to buy the physical game, oftentimes a set of discs, and any, um, and any expansions that come with it. And you have to pay, I might be dating myself with this number, but $15 a month to play it. It might be more now. But, okay, so 
we're moving to a subscription-based model. But all this costs money, right? And it's more money than games used to cost. And so people are, you know, games have improved a lot, that's true. But perhaps people haven't been able to keep up with the incredible cost of gaming, whether that is through DLCs or through, you know, other types of content, subscription services, what have you. And I've talked about the issues with subscription services in the past, but I think games can be a little different. It, it kind of depends. But again, the reason I'm talking about this is because I want to talk about kind of a, lar a larger economic shift. So while games are getting more expensive, you know what else is, that, is happening? Wages are not increasing. People are not actually making that much more money than they did when a game was $30 or $15, okay? So if the cost of games, and by the way, Games, and it, this is an allegory really for what's happening with all markets where the prices of things is getting, are getting higher and the cost of living are get, is getting higher and the amount of money that people are bringing in is generally staying the same or going down, right? So all this time, entertainment, games are getting more expensive to buy and to play because you have a new subscription or you need to buy the DLC or you need to buy the the cosmetic or you need the new gun or whatever it's going to be, that all costs money. But if you're not bringing in any more money, that feels like an incredible cost to you. It feels like the cost of video games are going up at a faster rate than you can afford. And so if you see a game that's free, well, the obvious choice is, well, this game doesn't require me to pay a ton of money to play it, so I should play the free game. So it makes it look like the gaming market is moving towards free-to-play games. But actually, I think the, most, the, the, the better lesson to take from this shift is actually games are becoming too expensive for the limited resources that individuals and workers have. So they're reverting to free games because we're just poor. We're just too broke to keep up with the the next biggest flashy game, or we don't buy as many games as we used to because we're worked harder, we don't have as much time on our hands, we're working multiple jobs, we're, we don't have as much money as we should have by this point in our lives if you're a millennial like me, or you just don't have a ton of money, ton of money generally because wages have been stagnant or declining. So I'm using this segment to, and using video games in general, to push back on a trend um, generally in the economy, where the prices of the things that we need and that we enjoy are going up, but the cost of employing us, of keeping us alive, from the employer's perspective, is either staying the same or going down. If our wages were higher, if we made more money, if we had more disposable income, if we had more disposable time, then we probably wouldn't be shifting to free-to-play games with these expansions we would probably just buy regular games. But because there are larger economic forces at work here that are not allowing us to prosper as much as we should be given the amount of work that we put into the system and given how much of our work goes to the capitalist class at the top, it makes sense that it looks like the market is shifting towards free-to-play things or in other, or millennials aren't buying houses or millennials aren't buying cars or whatever it is that millennials and Gen Z is being blamed for that's, you know, killing such and such a market. We don't have the money to afford all these big flashy things a lot of the time. If we didn't have student loan debt, if we didn't have low wages, if we didn't graduate into an economy that was constantly booming and busting and, and depleting our savings, if we didn't, if we didn't work in a system where our, our, the rent that was paid for our labor was low and the rent that we pay to live is high, constantly funneling money to people who are already rich. This system is inherently broken. And I believe that this story, and of course it started as a, as a lighter note story, but it really kind of devolved here. Apologies. It's just, this is a microcosm of all the other problems that are wrong with society. You can see it. It's not, difficult to see, and I hope by using a concrete example like the cost of video games over time, I have illustrated to you what the issues are, what we're expected to do and pay for, and why that doesn't make sense.
So the next issue I would like to talk about is, not issue per se, but the, the next topic I'd like to talk about is how economic economists perceive a property. Now this isn't just how economists perceive a property, um, many leftists perceive a property this way, I'm sure capitalists perceive a property this way, but I'm using the title how economists perceive a property just as a general coverall for all the different types of people who perceive property in this very niche way under capitalism that I am going to explain to you now. So capital is a funny term in economics because it has two meanings. The first meaning is a four branch tree, which defines all of the, um, all of the uh, property in a system. Okay. And capital also means money. So like liquid capital, for example, just means money or currency. So the four, the, the four pillars of the capital tree are as follows. Okay. Entrepreneurship. And I'm going to explain each of these after I do um, my counting off. So just hang tight. So entrepreneurship, land, capital, and labor or human capital. Okay. So let's start with the first one, entrepreneurship. So what is entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial capital? So entrepreneurial capital is essentially the idea for something. Now it doesn't have to be a new something. It just has to be idea for the idea for something, but the founding idea. So if you are a bakery, then your founding idea is either your chief recipe or a family cookbook or just ideas in your head about how a patisserie could be run better, right? You essentially have an idea for a business or for a, a co-op or however you want to run your establishment. The individual who has the idea or, or the individuals, individual or individuals who have the idea or ideas, they have the entrepreneurial capital. They are what gets the business driver moving, okay? Now, once you have an entrepreneurial idea, you need the other three types of capital, okay? So the next type of capital we talk about is land. And I don't mean like, like farms, um, although farms are a type of land capital. I mean any type of land capital. You could have an office space in a huge building. Um, you could have a food cart. You could have uh, an area of the sidewalk where you play music for money, right? Land capital could be a lot of different things. But essentially, at the end of the day, land capital is the space, the physical space, in which you do the thing that you have come up with in your entrepreneurial capital prom of this four capital tree, okay? After that, we have capital, which in this sense means money or currency. So a lot of times this means either seed currency, uh, seed money from an investor or multiple investors, money that you've saved up, or, or some other type of investment that you have in order to get your business going. The, the old saying, you have to spend money to make money, in some ways is true about businesses in the, cap, in the businesses in the capitalist sphere, or you have to borrow money to make money, whatever, whatever you want to say, right? But that third branch of the tree, capital, it provides the it, it provides you the ability to buy other things. So capital in this case also includes assets. So capital generally means money, but it can also mean assets. So those can be liquid assets like money. Those can be non-liquid assets like, so let's go back to our, our patisserie example earlier, right? So if you have, if our entrepreneur, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's say it's a, a, you know, a group of chefs, they decide that they want to open a patisserie, right? They have ideas for what makes a great patisserie and what types of baked goods that they could make that are going to woo the public, right? They are going to need land, whether that is a storefront or a little, or a food cart or a food truck or um, their own homes or whatever. They, they need some kind of land capital. They need some place to do the business that they want to do. Next, they need capital. They need assets of some kind. So that's gonna be like an industrial kitchen. So ovens, fans, um, <clears throat> washing stations, sanitizing stations, chopping stations, food storage, refrigerators, freezers, pantries, right? All these things go into, and, and they're things that can be bought and sold, right? They're, they're non-perishables, um, as it were. 
And then of course, you have to fill those, and you have to use your leftover liquid capital to buy the things you need to actually run the business. Flour, egg, sugar, butter. Um, God, I made myself hungry um, with this. I should have picked a different example, a less hungry example, but that, that aside. So they need to use their liquid capital to buy all the other things that they need. And then there's the last bit of capital that our uh, patissiers need, which is human capital or labor capital. And that's us, you and me, regular workers. The reason that we fall under the category of capital is because it costs money to employ us. Now, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the idea that when um, costs are high and capital needs to be cut, the first capital that goes is human capital, right? Oftentimes, and for many businesses, the highest recurring cost is labor, right? So it's the easiest one to cut. It's harder to sell an oven in a patisserie because you need it to make your products. It's easier to fire someone, just have someone else work a longer shift or what have you, right? So anyway, that goes to human capital, which, uh, which as I said, is workers. But they don't have to be employees. Human capital can be any type of um, relationship where there is pay exchange in, in exchange for work. It can be independent contractors. It can be, um, you know, people who are on revolving schedules or, or work for large organizations and just pass through and, and things like that. There are lots of ways that human capital can be organized. But at the end of the day, it is the fourth branch of our capital tree, which is human capital. So I'm going to cap up this segment by talking uh, by talking all the way through our patisserie example. And then hopefully finding a pastry that I can shove in my face. Um, <laughs> probably not, though. So our first example, we have our group of chefs. They have an idea. This is their entrepreneurial capital. They use this entrepreneurial capital to maybe pitch an idea, get some investors, or they use their savings, uh, which is our capital, our money capital, our liquid capital, to start the business. In order, in order to do that, they also need a place to do business, land capital. They put up a storefront somewhere. That's their land capital. They then fill this storefront with ovens and refrigerators and knife blocks and cutting boards and pantries and offices and tables and chairs and glasses and drink machines and all this. Other stuff. These are all assets, right? And then the last thing, before they can finally open, they need people who will wait the tables, clean the tables, clean the windows, make the, uh, make the pastries, sell the pastries, work the register, things like that. That is the human capital. So with these four capitals combined, we are able to open our lovely patisserie and hopefully the business takes off. Great, all sounds good. There is, and so now that I've explained kind of how this property is perceived, I wanna talk a little bit about what happens in businesses with this, right? So one of the major issues with the way this is perceived of, is that there is no inherent balancing act required between the different costs and benefits of human capital, labor capital, so human capital, labor capital, land capital, asset capital, and entrepreneurial capital, right? No one says you have to pay your work, pay your workers more than you paid for your assets, or more than you pay for your rent, or more than you pay for your ideas. And and, and you can you can you know, you can use that rule with any of the four items. I'm not going to go through all 16 combinations, but you get the general idea, right? There is no one capital that inherently dominates over the other ones. As we have moved forward in this capitalist experiment that we have been under, what tends to happen is that organizations reward entrepreneurial capital or the leadership of an organization much more than they're willing to reward the um, the workers of an organization or in land or anything else. So CEO pays go up, worker pay stays the same, or goes up very slowly, or God forbid goes down. Land oftentimes is wholly owned by the company or a company that it owns. So oftentimes for a lot of it, the only cost you're paying is property tax. And that in the grand scheme of things is very low. Asset capital for many organizations, assets don't cost them a ton of money to maintain. So the amount of money that goes there is typically um, fairly low, very low, or non-existent. Oftentimes an asset can last for a very long time. So once you purchase it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and of course you can always repair it, which costs a little bit more money, but again, not really, um, you know, not really the end of the world there. So what happens 
when hu the human capital that you have is producing lots of liquid capital for the organization. That capital can either be given out to shareholders in public companies, or it can be re reinvested in private companies. Either way, that money has to go somewhere, in theory. Now, as a socialist, I personally think the best place to put that money is in the pockets of your workers. But, uh, and to improve the quality of your human capital by paying them more. And, and I, by the way, I'm using human capital. I'm not meaning to dehumanize workers. I myself am a worker. So I'm just giving this in the, the flattest, most economic terms that I can give it in and not be, you know, and not try and create personas for this, uh, for these laborers or for these people. But there are workers, I respect them. I think they should be doing better. Okay, so just that aside. So what happens when the labor capital is making, is helping the business a lot more than the other types of capital are, like entrepreneurial capital, for example. Oftentimes what ends up happening, partially because of greed, but partially because that's how the system is incentivized, is that the people with the ideas, who had the ideas at first, who may no longer be part of the workforce or may only be supervisory in nature, take the fat of wealth, take the liquid capital, and they reinvest it in themselves. They raise their wages, they open new stores, they hire more people, but at lower cost, uh, but um, at lower wages than they could than if they just reinvested that capital in their human capital, right? reinvested that, that liquid capital in their human capital. So the system that incentivizes this different distribution of capital is actually the enemy of socialists and leftists. It's not actually the breakup of these it's not actually the breakup of capital into the four sub branches of capital, um, you know, labor, entrepreneurial, land, and, and you know, money. That will that set of capital will likely exist no matter what economic system we exist under. It might be called something else other than capital, but you know, you get the general idea. These four branches of how enterprise works will likely persist past capitalism, past social democracy, maybe even past socialism. But regardless of what economic system you have in place, you are very likely to have these four different types of capital. The economic system that we have, capitalism, communism, socialism, whatever, essentially determines what share of the excess of these four branches should be reinvested where. In capitalism, you give to your shareholders because we've passed laws and, and made corporations responsible for making their shareholders as wealthy as possible in exchange for their investment, whatever that investment happens to be. In a socialist system, uh, that excess capital goes to the workers who in some cases may be, may also own the entrepreneurial capital, but in some cases may just, you know, the entrepreneurial capital may be paid what it's due and then severed, or they're just treated as another part of human capital. And although they may be rewarded more for their contribution, they're not rewarded unfairly more or so much more uh, than the regular, than, than, you know, everyone else who participates as human capital. So anyway, this kind of got, uh, got away from me a little bit, but I've been meaning to talk about this for a long time. This is a great little lesson in economics. If you have any questions about any of this, obviously leave a comment uh, on Facebook or YouTube. I am more than happy to discuss this. Uh, I really enjoy talking about this stuff, and it's really helpful for us to understand how these economic systems work in order for us to overthrow them. And I'm gonna end with a kind of a funny story. So I have been uh, a leftist for a very long time, and in high school, I did not want to take economics because it was going to be inherently a capitalistic course and it was probably going to be gross and, and all this other stuff. It turned out not to be, but the thing that made me take it was someone who I knew who wanted to encourage me to take economics and said, hey, you can't know how to beat them if you don't know what they're doing. If you don't understand the way the system works, you can't take it down. And that has been a great piece of advice that I have been happy to roll with um, essentially my entire life. So I encourage you to keep learning with me uh, and to keep getting educated with me. Uh, and we will, we will find the ways to tackle these systems because we will learn how these systems work and undermine them that way. All right. 
I have one teeny tiny microscopic but also huge story that I want to talk about in these last couple of minutes here. So a couple of weeks ago, Royal Dutch Shell, um, who you may just know as Shell, the oil company, um, was forced by a court ruling to cut their emissions by 45%. Climate activists took them to court, and the court said, uh, agreed with the climate activists and said, yes, you shall, um, by, I think by um, 2030, have to cut your emissions by uh, 45%. Essentially, this was to put Shell, in, Royal Dutch Shell, in line with the Paris Climate Accords, which I believe Holland is a party to. So what does this mean for you, the average person, or uh, in either the Netherlands or in the US? So the first and most important takeaway from this particular story is that fighting works. And arguing in a legal context that we are being harmed by these organizations, by their misbehavior, apparently is enough to sway judges. Now, Shell, for its part, has said it's going to appeal the ruling and yada yada, but there is an opinion out there somewhere in, in Dutch court saying that essentially the harms that Shell is causing by its behavior today, the, the, har the tomorrow harms that it's causing by its behavior today are unlawful, are illegal almost. So, it is really important for us to remember this when we go forward to think about the possibility of, hey, what if, you know, what if we are able to change the way, use the court systems, use the legal systems to change the way these companies operate to help save our future? Now, I don't know if we're past the point of no return on climate. I really hope we're not. I really hope there's something we can do with it. But this gives me hope that there is at least some reason left, something in the, the legal and judicial systems that we can do to fight back against uh, these corporations that are robbing us of our future. And if, you know, climate activists in Holland can do it, I think climate activists anywhere can do it. The second thing to take, uh, to take note of is that while, the, while these companies begin to cut back, there is a... a a mild difficulty ingrained in this, which is society has to move away from fossil fuels and and way away from non-renewable sources of energy. So, it, as these companies are forced to reduce their uh, reduce the amount, of, so certain companies are forced to reduce the amount of emissions they create. There's a race to the bottom type. Uh, type economics here, where if Shell can't do the emissions, then, you know, another company, Gulf, might, because they see that there's an opening in the market and they'll just go and fill it, because that's how capitalism works. You, you, you fill as much of the market as you possibly can, one second, you fill as much of the market as you possibly can in order to maximize your profit share. So not only do we need to have courts telling these organizations that you need to reduce your carbon emissions by certain by certain huge margins. The next thing you have to do is you have to make sure that you are uh, you have to make sure that society is also making the demand for these products much lower, such that it becomes both a market imperative and a legal imperative to reduce the amount of emissions and to change the way that we participate in our environment. Because if we don't this is going to become a wild goose chase. We will never ever do it because there will always be some market. So, you know, switch to electric, you know, funds to switch to electric cars or to improve mass transit and, and things like that. There are the answers to change this, to, to save ourselves from climate catastrophe in theory are in front of us. So we have to participate with them. We have to make sure that rulings like this are actually, um, are actually good. I don't say they're actually good, but are actually help effectuate a, a cleaner climate for tomorrow. Because if we don't change what we're doing in line with some of these legal decisions, then we don't actually make any progress. Then the ruling will have been for nothing. So, all right. As you heard, our timer went off, which means it is the end of our politics segment which means you get to see my beautiful face again. And as you can see, our lovely breads have risen. 
So, I am not going to do this next part on camera, but, well actually, one second. Let's, if you are going to boil water to put in your pan, start boiling it now, okay? Um, so, what's going to happen next is we are going to Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry about that. No. Um. All right. So what we are going to do now is we have started boiling some water. That boiling water, when it's ready, is going to go in our pan at the bottom. Use hot hands, please. Your oven is very hot. It's 450 degrees. And so when your water is ready, you are going to take each of your bits of parchment, you can see that they, you can see they move around here, okay? And you're going to slide each of these breads onto the very hot tray we've got preheating, okay? They're gonna sit pretty close to each other, but the parchment should stop them from sticking together. So don't worry about that too much. Um, and they're gonna sit in for 24 to 48 minutes. Um, do try and rotate them halfway through if you can, so about, about the 14 minute mark or the 12 minute mark. Just make sure they're not browning on one side more than the other, and if so, do rotate them. Uh, that'll keep the color nice and even and beautiful and consistent. And then after about 28 minutes, you'll perform the knock test, right? So you'll take your knuckle, uh, you'll knock against the bread. If it sounds like hollow, you are done. Oh, um, if you don't want to do the knuckle test and you have a thermometer, you want to make sure the inside of your bread at the thickest point in your bread reads 205 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. If for some reason it takes longer for your oven to cook your bread, do not fret. Bread being a little browner is not going to hurt your bread. If anything, it'll give you a nice and beautiful crust. If you want an even more beautiful crust on this bread, although I'm not going to do it because I enjoy kind of the soft crust, but if you want a really hard crust, um, oh, sorry. You will get a you will get a a hard-ish crust because of the steaming. We're using a boiling water to create a steam bath. But if you want your um, if you want your crust to be even harder, um, you just take a paintbrush and and spritz a little bit of water uh, on a uh, paintbrush or a spoon and spritz a little bit of water onto your bread. Being careful not to deflate it and. Uh, being careful not to, to pump the air out of it because the air that's in it now is going to help it grow and become really nice and beautiful. All right, guys, that is all for this week. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I will see you next time. We will not be making an episode next week for the July 4th U.S. holiday. Uh, we will have our next episode. Um, our next episode will be on July 10th, which is the Saturday after July 3rd, which is the day before July 4th. I don't know why I told you all that, but we will be back on July 10th for our 14th episode, and I'm not going to tell you what we're making because I don't know yet, but hopefully we will have a great new bread recipe for you uh, for the 14th. As usual, the videos will be up on Facebook and YouTube shortly, uh, at least by the end of the weekend. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the description. Uh, please leave them in the comments below or send a message on Facebook. Additionally, I'm thinking about streaming this to Twitch, so if you think that is a good idea, um, please feel free to leave your comment on this video or on our Facebook. We would be happy to hear from you. And that's it. I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.